In this short video, we're going to look at a measure that pops up on research reports, is mentioned in the press quite a bit, and that's beta. It's a way of measuring volatility. It's not the only way, but in this short video, I want to concentrate on this one. And for reference, it's often referred to as beta, but you may also see, to it, see it referred to like that, using more or less my approximation of a Greek symbol. So with no more ado, the problem, why do we care about something called beta? Why would anyone stick that on a research report? Well, the biggest problem for most investors, it's not the only problem when picking shares, but it's the biggest one, is price risk. What is the risk that shares go down as well as up? Now, there are other risks, and beta doesn't deal with them. So in other videos, I talk about liquidity risk, which is the risk that you can't sell a share all of a sudden, and I talk about default risk. That's the issue of going bust. But that's not what beta's about. Beta focuses solely on volatility, and volatility is simply the wobbliness of the share price, if you like. And what beta tries to do, as we'll see in a moment, is to capture the extent to which a share moves against a chosen benchmark. Does it go with the benchmark? Does it go further than the benchmark? Or does it kind of underperform the benchmark? And that's what beta is all about. And you might think, well, what's the use of that exactly as an observation? Well, that'll become clear in just a minute. So what is beta? It is the volatility in one number of a share or a fund that can be applied in different ways relative to a chosen benchmark. Now, the benchmark is to some extent uh, chosen by the person who comes up with the number, beta. So it could be the FTSE 100, if you're looking at, say, a large share in the UK market, it could be the all share, or it could even be the relevant sector, or you can do betas for both. So one key question to ask as an investor, if you're ever looking at beta is, well, how's it been calculated? And what's the chosen benchmark? Some benchmarks are better than others. But that's the principle. Now, how's it calculated? I'm not going to go through all the rocket science in an introductory video, but in essence, what someone will do is perhaps they'll say, right, let's look back over the last two years. Now, clearly you've got to look backwards because you haven't got data for the future, although beta is trying to tell you something about the future. So you look backwards over, say, a two-year period. You say, right, what happened to the benchmarks? I want to pick the FTSE 100. What did it do in terms of movement? Then you look at the share or the fund, and you say, how did the performance of that share or fund compare to the benchmark? Does the share tend to overshoot the benchmark, undershoot the benchmark? Does it sort of go with the benchmark? Is it kind of moving with the market? That's what beta is trying to establish. Because uh, the closer to the benchmark a share moves, arguably, the kind of less volatile it is, obviously depending on what that benchmark does over time. So that's the principle. And what you get out, I'm not going to go through all of the maths here. There's a, a, something called regression analysis, which enables you to look back and work out the relationship and condense it into a number. But for most investors, it's like, well, I don't need someone to do that if, if you're going to publish it and give it to me. So the key is the number itself. And it comes out, now it could come out as anything in principle, but normally it's a range of 0 to 4. That's a typical range. I'm not saying it, it, it couldn't be outside that range, but that's a fairly typical range. You've got a number, somewhere between 0 and 4. So what? All right, so let's assume someone's crunched the numbers for you. They've looked back over, say, the last two years, compared the FTSE 100 to the share you're looking at, and said the beta is one or two or three. So what? Okay. Well, in essence, this is what beta is all about. All right, let's say that you've got an index. Now, slightly artificial, this example, just three periods. You've got an index traveling up. So that, that could be the FTSE 100 index of leading shares in the UK. And it's just meandering up period after period after period. A share that has a high beta, now it's a bit artificial to call it a completely straight line, I know, as a high beta will tend to outperform the index, if you like. It'll, it'll go faster than the index. It'll go up faster. Okay, and beta's all about capturing how much faster. Whereas a low beta stock, you get a low number, will tend to sort of underperform the index. Now, in reality, that line in the middle wouldn't be dead straight, and neither would the line above and below it. I mean, in reality, the, the middle line might look more like this. So, you know, your high beta stock is one that kind of sort of does that. It's a, it's a more exaggerated profile, and your low beta stock almost sort of runs underneath the curves of the line. But you get the idea. So it's trying to identify, is this a stock that races ahead of the market or dips further than the market, or is it a stock that actually is less volatile than the market? Low beta stocks tend to be that. So, interpretation, you get the number out. You see on a report it says beta of one. What does that mean? 
That means a stock that basically moves with the benchmark. So if you look at the FTSE 100, for example, there are some big companies in there, you can look at any index, and some of those will, will broadly move with the market. They almost, they are the market because they're so huge in market capitalization terms. Whereas stocks that have high beaters, now I've put technology firms, for example, so that's more than one, all right, now that could be two, for example. A beta of two tends to suggest that if the market moves up, say, 10%, the stock you're looking at will, on average, move 20%. And equally, if the market drops 10% with a beta of two, that suggests you're going to get twice the movement out of the stock, so it will drop 20%. So you can see on the upside and the downside, it's out racing the market. It's going up more and down more. Whereas, with less than one beta, so 0.5, for example, say you've got 0.5 handed to you, that would mean if the market goes up 10%, the stock you're looking at will only go up 5%. The market drops 10%, the stock will only drop 5%, because the beta is a half. Relationship's 50%, if you like, in that sense. And occasionally, not very often, you can even get negative betas. That's where the market rises 10%, and what you're looking at drops by 10%, and vice versa. That's fairly unusual, associated with things like inverse exchange traded funds, which in fairness, I'll leave to another video. So, how's that useful? How is knowing that, for say the last two years, useful? It's got several uses. Number one, it can help you pick stocks that match your risk appetite. High beta stocks tend to be more volatile, more risky, you get more bang for your buck in a bull market, but conversely, they fall harder and faster in a bear market. So, you know, you pay your money and take your choice to some extent. Now, if you don't want to take that risk, you want to diversify your portfolio, again, beta can help because a balanced portfolio will tend not to have all high beta stocks, not to have all low beta stocks. It will be a mix and match the two, some low beta, some high beta. So if you're looking at sectors, you know, maybe some utility stocks, it's not a recommendation, by the way, some technology stocks, for argument's sake, to get a bit of beta balance in there. And market timers, now, I'm not suggesting you ought to be one of those necessarily, you can actually use this to their advantage. If the market's rising, the theory says you want to be in high beta stocks because they'll rise quicker. If the market's falling, you want your low beta stocks because you will lose money less quickly, is the theory. Now, that might sound brilliant. You might think, well, great, well, that's all I need then. That's the only number I need for investing. But unfortunately, that's rarely true. What's wrong with beta or what do you need to be aware of? It makes a lot of assumptions. Most important one, the past is a guide to the future. Maybe, maybe not. The problem with beta is to calculate it, you have to look backwards. So look backwards over two years, look backwards over five years, but you are effectively saying, what I get from the past is a guide to the future. Sometimes it isn't. The period over the day, which today is extracted, you get different betas for the same stock on the same day of the week from different providers. You might think, well, how does that happen? Well, it's because they're using different calculation methods. So if you're given a beta, well, a sensible question to ask is, Roughly, how was this calculated? Am I comparing apples with apples in terms of betas? And the appropriateness of the benchmark. I won't go into something, sounds a bit ghastly, um, called R squared, but there is a way of testing whether the benchmark you've chosen is sensible for the stock you're looking at. Because obviously, you know, if I look at a big um, stock in the UK market, I could choose the sector, get a beta for that. I could choose the FTSE 100, I could choose the FTSE All Share. And frankly, it's my choice. It's my beta if I'm publishing it. So that's another factor. And finally, um, beta is really only telling you what a stock does in relation to the market. All right, it's not really telling you much about the risk of that specific stock. And that's the kind of final caveat with beta. If you want stock specific risk, as opposed to how the stock will perform making certain assumptions or looking back on the market, great, for the stock specific stuff, you need to go elsewhere. So I'll finish on that caveat. Covered quite a lot of ground there. Any questions? Editor at killick.com.